It's wonderful to be here amongst so many colleagues and friends. I'm Annette Michaud and uh, I'd like to welcome my panel. I'd like to acknowledge the terrible people um, and the learning that they're the Sunrise people is beautiful, seeing it's such a beautiful morning here in Brisbane. Our theme today is around keeping children safe and settled and stable. Um, what I'll do is start this off. I'll speed you through seven strategies and then my colleagues will uh, also be rounding out what we have to say. And I think it's going to really set up the conference well for some of the Q&A sessions uh, that come later. Anywho. We have a very important opportunity at the moment. I think these opportunities for reform and reflection come, th come around about once every 10 to 20 years in child welfare. We're no longer working without knowledge and some level of evidence. We've got evidence and we've got reforms nationally um, and internationally that have led us to refocusing on and ramping up our early intervention efforts and also our permanency efforts. We know that prevention and early intervention are the key to reducing the flow of children into out-of-home out care and in our child protection system. So we desperately need to invest in services that address early structural risk factors that make families vulnerable to state intervention and provide targeted support for parents facing severe disadvantage. And I know a number of jurisdiction, jurisdictions are looking at exactly this. We know so much about children now, how they grow and how they develop, and we know that parents and carers play the most critical role in ensuring that children thrive. There's lots of evidence now that if we could better support carers and parents earlier by engaging them more effectively with approaches that work, and sometimes quite intensively, we could stop a significant number of children coming into our child welfare system in the first place. For children to thrive, their lives need to be on an even keel. And when life storms happen, which they will through things like poverty, housing instability, addiction, we need lighthouses and safe harbours like adequate income support, housing assistance, safe communities and parenting support so that all our children can thrive. The second strategy I wanted to briefly talk about is that the system won't work when we set and forget. Um, Auntie Vanessa talked about the level of support we need to give to children, um, both before they go into care, but when they're in care too. Uh, increasing stability, we need to absolutely support carers and build carer capacity and skills. Organising for permanency and stability for children in out-of-home care is the critical second chance for children and their families. In reality, our system needs to turn what we know works for children into common practice in our services and in our out-of-home care system. Long-term, stable living arrangements are absolutely critical. This is why stability is so important, because multiple placements affect attachment to primary caregivers, and empirical evidence is clearly showing us that multiple placements impact on children negatively, uh, causing ongoing trauma and, ex and externalising problem behaviours. So I just want to dig a briefly and a little bit deeper into this adult capacity building model. And I know there's uh, sessions at this conference on coaching and support models for better supporting carers. We need our practitioners to be skilled up. I'm just going to focus on what that means for, parent, uh, for parents and carers, though. Children aren't blank slates when they come into care. They're coming into care having a, a lot of the time experienced trauma. Um, we need skilled and attentive adults to care for them. Carer skills are highly modifiable, okay? Carers can build their skills and build them quickly and well. And, and we need practitioners and systems that support carers to build this capacity. Carer skills are recognised in the evidence as a critical element of effective placement. And these skills are not just great parenting skills, it's things like communication, ability to offer a variety of experience to children, understanding of trauma, self-care, coping, um, self-care, sorry, I said self-care, self-care twice, very important, self-compassion and self-regulation, valuing learning, and critically important, valuing connection to birth family. How well are we doing that? 
There are personal characteristics that we can support and build on. Things like tolerance for rejection, flexible expectations and a sense of humour. We all know this when we're raising children, particularly older children in out-of-home care. Uh, some research from the Longitudinal Study in New South Wales uh, really illustrates how carer satisfaction with the help they receive from their worker, their caseworker, and carers with less stress are associated with less placement change. How good is that? That's really important that we support, um, we, we help our caseworkers support our carers. The third point is around children's experiences and outcomes need to inform our system. We now have lots of data around the outcomes for children in out-of-home care. How are we using this data to do things differently? Children under five are less likely to experience placement changes. Uh, older children at first placement are likely to experience placement dis more likely to experience placement disruption. Kinship care is less likely to be disrupted. Um, children with a history of multiple types of abuse are more likely to experience instability. If we know all this, we can design things earlier to support carers to guard against these things occurring. Um, so it's really important that the wealth of data from studies informs our practice, but we also have a wealth of data from children themselves. The Create Report Cards are a fantastic example of how we can use data to improve our system. The fourth strategy is really building understanding of the strategies that work, when and for whom. We know that kinship care that, uh, has a fair bit of efficacy from some of, the, uh, some of the systematic reviews. We know that children with challenging behaviours fare better in therapeutic or treatment foster care than in residential or group care. So we need to really look at and en enhance support for these models. And I know there's work happening at this moment in Australia, particularly around therapeutic foster care. But what works for reunification? If we're going to, if we're going to look at children in long-term care and reducing numbers in long-term care, we need to look at reunification options. And there's some really useful evidence showing that a serious obstacle to reunification following placement in out-of-home care is our lack of engagement with parents, natural parents when their kids go into care. We have to, we have to keep parents engaged if we want to take kids home later. Um, but what works for reunification? There's been a really nice review that's come out this year showing that goal-orientated, family-focused engagement strategies that really look at parenting behaviours and attitudes can really help parents um, get their kids back. In fact, they're 2.5 times more likely to get their kids back if we use some of these strategies that show evidence of efficacy with getting kids home. The other theme is around not setting and forgetting when children go into permanency arrangements like adoption, like guardianship. And the evidence from the US and from the UK is showing that we need to ensure available and skilled post-permanency support as it's essential to, risk, uh, to reduce those risk factors for instability. So about 40% of kids who are adopted in the UK have disabilities and there's strong evidence that those children need ongoing and sometimes intensive support at different stages of their development. Children with challenging behaviours are also likely to need ongoing support. So we definitely need to look at the evidence around permanency and what's needed to ensure children remain in permanent placements. And we need to use a mix of approaches. Realising an evidence-based system isn't just one thing. It will take a mix of empirically tested evidence-based programs, local innovation to address some of the gaps we have in the evidence, and an approach that allows for Australian evidence building. We know a lot of our research is quite Western-focused. Uh, Indigenous researchers, particularly from New Zealand and parts of Australia, are telling, us, are telling us that there are different ways of knowing and different ways of evaluation that count for Indigenous communities. And Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families and communities are telling us that social justice and action is a key element if we're going to change things in communities of Aboriginal children. Um, it also makes sense to look at whether a program's implementable. We can't just pluck something from somewhere else and assume it can be implemented in Australia. There are lots of structural factors to make sure things are implemented well. My final point is that we do actually need to change the conversation. We need to change the way we communicate about children with care experience and their families to garner public support and avoid stigma and stereotypes. My time's up. Um, parents, uh, 
really briefly. We've got research now showing the way we talk about parents and parenting is unproductive and buys into some of the stigma that means people don't come forward when they need help. And there's some really important research coming out of Scotland telling us uh, around children in care that says the way we frame the care experience is really problematic. And we could continually promote notions of a system in crisis and incapable of changing. And we need to shift that to a system that provides the full spectrum of care for kids and is capable of changing. But most importantly, we need to move away from children in care as damaged, abnormal others, which is a lot of our rhetoric, to children in care as invested with potential and having the same goals and aspirations as every other child. So that's the summary of the seven strategies. And I'd like to invite my colleague Deirdre now to give us a picture of some of the reforms that are happening in New South Wales. I'll click you. Morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and also a shout out to my colleagues in the room. Um, so I, I kind of feel like we're doing some weird version of speed dating here, because <laughs> it's like you know the universe condensed into what you can say in five minutes or less. Um, so um, I'm going to give it a go. I do want to give a shout, shout out to some of my colleagues uh, who are in the audience are doing a much more enriched version of this tomorrow morning. So uh, please, uh, please go hear what they have to say. So I want to, I want to sort of talk about three key things. Where have we come from? What are the things that we're focusing on now? And where do we think we are? And then uh, a bit of a touch on what did I think we, get, we got right? What are the things that we still need to really focus on? Um, and it tells me that people in an audience really love to hear from a senior bureaucrat about when we completely stuff things up. So um, I, I will try and weave in the, uh, the learning moments uh, and hope to turn them into teaching moments. Um, so where have we come from? So like most uh, Australian jurisdictions, um, over the last five years, we have experienced continued demand on child protection services, year-on-year-on-year on year demand. Um, five years ago, my frontline colleagues in child protection were doing a full assessment of around 12,000 whole children that related to around 90,000 ch children who were reported at risk of significant harm in New South Wales. Today, we're seeing about 30,000, and I'll talk a little bit about how, how we've got there. So where we came from was um, sort of uncontrolled um, demand at the front end. Um, and because we weren't responding early enough or intensively enough, um, that was really driving the um, numbers of ch children coming into out-of-home care. So like every other jurisdiction, we've had a history of um, particularly over the last five to eight years, increasing numbers of child children coming into out-of-home care, um, significant over-representation of Aboriginal children. We also knew from the research and from the evidence and, of course, from the practice experience of my colleagues that um, many of those child children who were in out-of-home care were experiencing multiple placements um, and really feeding into the tra trauma that they had experienced coming into care. And the evidence about their long-term outcomes was, of course, very poor. So an all-round um, sad and very difficult st story. I'm just going to assume that I press the big green button. The big green button, excellent. Um, so what have we been doing? Um, so uh, uh, four or five really big key things. The first thing is we really double down on trying to do more early child protection work. We're really we're testing the hypothesis that if we got in earlier into families before they really got into trou trouble and we could refer them to um, evidence-based programs or inten intensive early programs, that we might be able to turn the curve um, in relation to the numbers of child children coming into out-of-home care. So over the last couple of years, we've really doubled down on investing in evidence-based programs, so MST and FFT and um, safe care. Uh, really as, a, as our way of saying we, th we think there's something in this early end of the work that if we really focus our efforts, we can do much better for those children and fam families. 
The second big thing that we did and that we have been doing and we will continue to do and will forever do is really get clear about the practice, the practice of our work. What does it mean? What is the meaning it holds? What are the tools needed? How to skill our workers? Um, what are the values? How do we... Really? Gosh. Um, <laughs> how, do we, how do we work in this, in this uh, field with respect and empathy and compassion? Um, and how do we value the work and value the families that we work with? So we've launched a practice framework and spend a lot of time and effort really embedding that into the work of our front frontline workers. The third thing that we did, of course, as a government, we also made some legislative change to then bake in the permanency principles. Um, we really turned to what did we know about what was going right and what was going wrong for ch children out of home care and really doubled down on focusing on permanency and stability and back that in with some le legislative change. And then lastly, what we've also been doing is um, uh, probably the largest reform in out-of-home care in New South Wales in a decade is um, implementing the permanency support program. So in New South Wales, um, over 50% of all ch children are cared for and supported by the non-government sector which means that the case management is also with the non-government sector. So um, over the last couple of years, we've been working with our non-government sector partners to really focus on permanency and stability. So in a real sense, what that means is that we recontracted, recommissioned all of the contracts that we have with the non-government sector, and we sort of baked in the permanency principles. So in a contractual way, we incentivise restoration and getting to long-term permanent um, arrangements for children and the least preferred option is long-term foster care. Uh, so I, I've just kind of talked about that like that was such an easy thing to do and it has really not at all been a very easy thing to do. Um, at the same time, we also re commissioned um, out of our old residential care models into um, a new model of care around intensive therapeutic care. Um, <clears throat> so where are, we, where are we at now? So um, any of you that know me know that I'm a complete data nerd, so my, my nerd side is showing now. Um, so just to kind of give you a bit of a, a snapshot about what this is really about, sort of shows that year on year we've been increasing the amount of child protection work that we've been doing, so the earlier work, and we have been lifting the, the numbers of referrals to early intervention programs for families who, who need it. And one of the outworkings of that is we can actually also see um, the numbers of children coming into out-of-home care uh, for the last two and a half years, almost three years, we've had a reduction of new entries into out-of-home care year on year over the last couple of years, a 44% reduction um, of new kids coming into out-of-home care. And for the first time in a decade, we're actually seeing the overall population for ch children in out-of-home care in New South Wales starting to decrease. So because I promised to, I also want to talk about the things that we did not get right. So this has been a really big, complicated reform, and it was a lot of moving pieces all at the same time. We recontracted and recommissioned all of the family-based care with our um, non-government sector providers. We're trying to stand down an old model of residential care at the same time as standing up a new, as yet untested, model of intensive ther therapeutic care at the same time as introducing a brand new IT system. Like, what could go wrong, right? Like, I don't know, I don't know what the hell we were thinking, doing all that at the same time. It has been a really difficult couple of years and I'm sure some of my colleagues in the room would talk about that um, in great detail about how difficult the last couple of years are. But I do, I do really want to say though that I think that we are, I genuinely mean, I think that we are through the hardest part of the reform and the really key parts for us now, two things for us ahead. One is that we have to continue to be brave and follow the evidence. If we are doing things that we're stand, stand, standing up and in the end there is no evidence it's making any difference, 
we all have to be brave and call it and say that because the, the children that we're working with and their families and the communities deserve our courage to call it if it's not working. And the second thing for us, particularly in New South Wales, is really turning the curve about how we work in partnership with Aboriginal children, families, communities. And I really want to challenge us, my colleagues in the room, to turn our lens away from always talking about deficits to be talking about strengths. The, the road um, to success and hope is always going to be through, through strengths and recognising the strengths in each other. Um, so on that note, I'm now going to pass to my colleague, Claire. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Thanks very much. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge we're on Aboriginal land and, and acknowledge Vanessa and her personal contribution and the contribution of her family, the Fishers, uh, to children in, in this community and their broader community over many, many years. Uh, Vanessa and her sister were involved in the establishment of the first Aboriginal childcare agency in Brisbane back in the 1980s. I just want to take a step back to, look, to talk about what we what we mean when we're talking about permanency, relationships, identity and a sense of security. Um, because it's important not to leap to some of the mechanisms we might use to develop permanency. But think about how you develop a sense of permanency uh, for children, that they belong, that they have a place and that they have a base. So the theoretical foundations for that are around attachment theory, child development theories, and cultural identity development theories, the, the, the idea of you belonging to a group. So these are concepts about a family for life, felt security, um, maybe the family you were born into, uh, maybe a family you join, or maybe a combination of the two. Permanency planning's always been a key concept in child protection, right back from the, from the 1970s, where research on drift in care led to an impetus for more long-term planning, placement stability, family contact, reunification, and so on. But there's been a bit of a modern reinvention of permanency planning since the 1990s, mainly driven by a concern about high numbers of children in care. And that has a slightly different flavour, led to an impetus for restrictive timeframes for planning, permanency care orders and adoption, so the idea that you would take children out of the care system uh, and concurrent planning. I've been asked to talk about numbers. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to get some key concepts across. So the first one is just about the, the numbers of children in care prevalence. And um, currently around 46,000 children. It's about how many children there are at a point in time. And it's a function of incidence, so the ones who come in and the ones who leave and duration, how long they spend in care. So prevalence in care is certainly increasing and for the past 18 years where I've got data from, the rate per thousand children in care has actually doubled. So you can see that for the first you know, five years, the rate was around four to five per thousand, went up to between six and seven per thousand and now is over eight per thousand children in care. So this is a long-term consistent trend. But overall, Australia-wide, there actually aren't more and more children entering care. So entries are actually declining. Uh, and you can see there that um, the rate now is about, this is Australia-wide, all children, about two per thousand. And we compare that to the rate of entry in 2000, which was 2.5. Uh, so, over the past 18 years, we've had a high of 2.7 and a low of 1.2. There have been minor fluctuations up and down, but overall, it's a declining rate of entries, whereas the exit rate has stayed relatively uh, the same. So, the main reason that there are more and more children in care, the stock, is due to duration in care. So, children are staying longer in care. This is the same pretty much in like child protection systems. The UK and the US uh, have got, are experiencing the same issue. So regarding duration, in short and roughly, up to a decade ago, 60% of 
children were in care less than two years prior to exit and 40% stayed over two years. Now it's the reverse. Um, about 40% uh, stay less than two years and 60% stay longer. So if we want to reduce numbers in care, we really need to reduce the length of time children stay in care. More family reunification, especially in the first two years after entry. Reducing exits through things like permanent care orders and adoptions will go some way towards reducing prevalence, but it's likely to be marginal because reducing numbers uh, duration in care is such a long-term proposition. So entries and exits are what happened over a year and duration happens over up to 18 years. Um, keep in mind as well that low entry rates might mean that children are not entering care unnecessarily and that we're doing family preservation work or family restoration work better. And there's certainly much more investment, as Deirdre mentioned, in intensive family support around the country. But it might also mean that the threshold for entering care is higher and children are left in unsafe situations. We just don't know the answer to that. Turning to placement stability, so how many children, uh, how many placements children experience in out-of-home care. There's lots of problems with this data about what's counted as a move and so on, recognising that some moves are actually positive for children, moving to be with siblings, moving to be closer to family, to facilitate family contact and so on. But roughly last year, uh, most children who exited care after less than 12 months had only one to two placements. But for children who exited after 12 months or more, uh, less than half had one to two placements. So obviously, the longer you're there, the more placements you have. There hasn't been much change in the types of placements in, over the last 20 years. Around about half of children are placed with kin, 40% in foster care, 6% in resi, and 4% others. Research generally finds that kinship's more, is more stable than foster care, and residential care is the least stable. Placement stability is obviously really important because it goes to those key concepts of relationships, identity, and a sense of belonging. Permanency decisions aren't determined by a court order at a point in time. Prospects for permanency really depend upon what happens during the whole time a child's in care. I think it's important to, look, uh, to remember when looking at Australian data, it's absolutely essential to look at all the differences for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children on fa and families. On every single measure of child protection, contact, child protection contact, they're overrepresented and patterns are different for them. So the, the nature of their contact with the child protection system is completely unlike that of non-Indigenous families. And Vanessa spoke to what that's like on the ground. Uh, and this, what's going on for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children has a big effect on overall rates. So if we did ser something serious to address overrepresentation, we'd actually have a different looking child protection system. So I gave you some Australia-wide figures, um, but there are differences between four states. And here are four states, 20 years of data, entry rates. What do you notice? They're going up and down. Um, there's lots of reasons for this, legislative changes, uh, investment in prevention work, changes to counting rules and so on. But you can, well, you, you may or may not be able to see that New South Wales 20 years ago started at 2.8 and ended at 1.2. So there was a big drop last year, but it's overall a pretty consistent downward trend. Uh, Queensland, where we are, started at 1.4, so a very low base rate and ended at 2.2, but the average is two. It's been a pretty steady rate of entries to care. Victoria started at 2.6, ended at three, but the overall trend is downward. So risk averse practice before and after public inquiries tends to coincide with some changes in entry rates. But the takeaway message I think is that one swallow doesn't make a summer and you have to look over the long term at what's going on. Things go up and down year on year but overall, long term, the trend is entries are declining, so we have to look elsewhere for strategies to reduce the numbers of children in care. Uh, just some practice implications, but I'll leave it there and introduce my colleague, Natalie. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, good morning, everyone. Just bear with me. I'm, my throat's a little uh, raspy this morning. I'll try and keep it together. Um, my name is Natalie Lewis. I'm a Gamilaroi Yinna, and even though I've grown up um, in Queensland, every day I am a guest on Turbal and Yagara country. So I acknowledge their elders um, and their ancestors. And I particularly this morning, while you can't see her, she's hidden in the back here. That's who I blew a kiss to. Um, I want to acknowledge one of my elders, Annie Susie Blacklock. Um, she is a constant source of inspiration and a reminder to me about um, what integrity and cultural leadership looks like. Right, so I'm glad that some of my colleagues um, really this morning were able to um, articulate that difference between um, legal permanency and relational permanency. That's a particular um, area of interest for us when it comes to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children because without having an appropriate focus on relational uh, permanency, we lose the capacity to actually give effect to the international law obligations that pertain to our children about our rights to cultural continuity, the rights that are articulated in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of a Child and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. While stability is important for all children, stability for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children is grounded in the permanence of their identity in connection with family, kin and country. At SNAKE, we believe that achieving stability for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children requires recognition and implementation of their unique rights to maintain those connections. Permanent care and adoption measures tend to reflect an underlying assumption that children enter um, in out-of-home care um, with a void of permanent connection <clears throat> that needs somehow to be filled by the application of a permanent order. This understanding is flawed in, in its failure to recognise that children begin their out-of-home care journey with a permanent identity that is grounded in cultural, family and community connections. This is not changed by an out-of-home care order or adoption, but a consistent failure to acknowledge this is absolutely harmful to our children. Inflexible legal measures to achieve permanent care will sever these connections for our kids. It is in breach of their human rights and breaks bonds that are critical to their stability of identity while they are in care and for the duration of their lives. Every jurisdiction um, has child protection legislation that holds the ch that a child's safety and well-being is the paramount principle. Our children, Aboriginal children, have the same rights and expectations of safety as all Australian children. In this, there's no ambiguity and there's no double standard. But our children are also entitled to grow up with a sense of who they are, where they are from, and how they connect to our country. And they also have an we have an obligation to, in to ensure that our children foster a sense of belonging and obligation within their kinship structure. These are rights at international law. Uh, international law, they're not niceties, they're not optional extras, they are fundamental rights. While we are committed to looking forward, it is important that any discussion about reform um, that impacts upon Aboriginal children um, starts from a point of truth. And we don't have to look far back in history or much further than the Bringing Them Home report to see what history and our previous approaches have done to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I'm concerned that adoption and permanent care orders like those that have been introduced in Queensland <clears throat> are, are seen as a surefire way to achieve a single goal of legal permanency at the risk of compromising relational permanency and children's enduring right to cultural continuity. I'm absolutely aware of and fiercely support the entitlement of our children to safety and stability of placements, our relationships and certainties of their futures. While this approach um, may produce economic or reduce, sorry, economic and administrative burdens of child protection system. This burden is picked up by our kids when we fail to honour their right to cultural continuity. Both the adoption agenda and in, indeed the introduction of permanent care orders do not provide adequate safeguards to prevent against the adverse impacts or outright loss of connection to kin, country and culture for Aboriginal children. There are 18,000 of our children subject to statutory intervention in this country. When you think about how small our population, the population of our people is in Australia, imagine the no enormity of the impact of 18,000 of our children losing their identity and their sense of belonging. 
To change this trajectory of continuing overrepresentation, you just can't take the plug out. You also need to turn off the tap. Adoption as an option may provide an exit strategy for state child protection departments. At worst, a mass exodus to get the numbers down. Um, it allows them to deflect responsibility and sometimes significantly reduce costs. But will it produce better outcomes for children? And isn't that what we're trying to achieve? It's true that the policy position over the past decade has absolutely been to prioritise family preservation um, and reunification. Unfortunately, this position has not been backed with a significant redirection of resourcing to enable the rhetoric to become a reality. We cannot assume that the current situation of grossly increased numbers of Aboriginal children in out-of-home care is because that policy position is wrong, but it's a failure to operationalise the policy. There's been a lack of sustained purposeful action at multiple levels to actualise the long overdue structural reform that is necessary to give effect to the policy intent. Only when that's done will we see change. Despite the recognition of the need for greater focus, effort and resources targeted to prevention, um, addressing the conditions and disproportionate experience of disadvantage that drives overrepresentation over of our kids in the system, each year we see the opposite occur in terms of investment. More money into the tertiary end of statutory systems that continue to produce poor outcomes. <clears throat> Reunification fails because the supports that families need to require to avoid removal of their children in the first place are not available to them to support reunification. Investing in failure rather than in solutions, something that absolutely needs to change. So in terms of a solution, it's not all gloom and doom. Um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander child placement principle um, is in the context of pursuing stability and permanency for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in out-of-home care, I believe is the fundamental framework that needs to be adopted in every jurisdiction to see a change for our kids. The child placement principle, oops, I'm up, sorry. Do you want me to finish up? <laughs> so the child placement principle is the diagram up here. Um, an important thing to note is that um, the child placement principle, as it was sort of previously recognised as the hierarchy of placement, has existed, and I think you were going to ask me a question about that, but I might as well just answer it now. Um, uh, the child placement principle has existed in legislation in all jurisdictions. Unfortunately, that was a one-dimensional um, interpretation of the original intent of the child placement principle. So thankfully, under the National Framework for Protecting Australia's Children, in the third action plan and now consolidated in the fourth action plan, there was national recognition that the child placement principle encompasses all five of these elements. If we do these well, we will never get to a point where we have to consider adoption of an Aboriginal child outside of their kin, country or culture. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just have the... Um, thank you so much, Natalie, and to the panel. Um, the idea of the panel was to get a kind of diverse range of views, and clearly, when we're looking at permanency, there are some tensions, and I think Natalie highlighted that really clearly. We've got a bit of time for Q&A, as I understand it, and... I know that um, Stella will keep a close eye on me so I don't go over time. Um, I'm, I was hoping to channel some of the questions that you might have in the audience, but as I said, there are Q&As throughout the conference, so you'll have opportunities to follow up some of the things and themes from this morning. But I thought, given what Natalie was saying, I might ask Deirdre first, because I know in New South Wales and in other jurisdictions and in the UK, there are kind of time limits put on to things like permanency. And I'm just wondering, given, given the time limits, what kind of things can we do to ensure we don't rush to permanency? How do we make sure that we are absolutely not doing that thing where we rush to permanency and kids are bouncing back into the system later? Just wanted to get some insights from your work in New South Wales. Um, so am I on? Yeah. Um, so I think... Uh, Unlike any other industry, the only, the only asset, the only strength that we have is the quality of our practice. Um, uh, we're not making wheelbarrows, we're not, we're not manufacturing trucks like around <laughs> in the corner. Um, everything rises and falls on how well um, our workers can be um, 
can show empathy and compassion and humanity and be skillful in their work with families um, and children. So I think anything that we can do and all focus <coughs> about getting clear about the quality of practice and really staying true and focused on that, whether it's um, showing our frontline staff some of the skills and tools and producing toolkits, um, it's, it's all about the lifting the capability and the capacity of our, of our workers to do, to do that work with, directly with families. And then behind the scenes, it's all about um, us making sure that we have a line of sight of what the data um, tells us about what's happening in the system, but also all of the work that I know jurisdictions are doing to try and come to groups with um, individual outcomes for kids. So what information are we gathering about what's happening in the lives of children so that we can keep iterating and ch changing both our policy lens but also the way in which we do our work. And um, thank, you, thank you, Deirdre. And I just, just turning to you now, Claire, I'm just really interested in what the evidence is around these time limits for permanency. And if, if there are, you know, there's, obviously we want to get to kids to permanent arrangements, but are there some, are there some issues or what does the evidence tell us about these time frames? Uh, so there's not good evidence around time frames. It, well, there's not much in Australia at all. What we know from, and there are jurisdictional differences around this, about how, how strict the time frames are and, and there are a lot of evidence that there actually is some rushing to permanency to the detriment of children in, in other jurisdictions. Um, but I, so, so clearly, you know, the sooner children can return home, the better, and the sooner we make decisions about the long-term prospects for children, the better. That's absolutely clear. But any, any evidence around one year or two years, you know, it's, it's just not there. It's not sound enough. It's not strong enough. Uh, so I think that says we've got to make individual decisions about children in their interests. And um, that's all. We, in a, it's the same as what Deidre's saying. That's all we've got to go on is what's best for this children, this child, regardless of, of time frame. Mm -hmm. I think there are many... It's not straightforward. There are many competing issues. Uh, so we look at the evidence overall and say clearly it's desirable to make long-term decisions sooner rather than later, but that doesn't mean that later is ruled out for an individual child. Thank you. Um, and, and Natalie, thank you so much for your kind of uh, passionate advocacy and giving us a, a, a picture of how a system could look. Um, Different jurisdictions are working in different ways towards improving services for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. Yeah. Is there, are there any things you're seeing around the uh, permanency and placement principle that uh, are, are going well that you'd like the audience to know about, to have a look at and learn from? Yeah, there's certainly, um, um, Queensland um, last year um, we commenced um, you know the amendments to the Act, and Queensland's the only legislate the only jurisdiction in Australia that has adopted all five of the elements um, and embedded that within legislation. Um, one of the things that where we are seeing it having an impact is where the application of those five elements isn't just about a one point in time decision. Where we're seeing change is that we're, we're using those as um, points of truth, those five elements, when we're looking at policy, when we're looking at program design, when we're looking at processes like commissioning, recruitment, evaluation and monitoring. Um, we're looking at certainly in the space of, of practice. Um, and when you see consistent, when, they've all, when all of those system elements have a touch point of the five elements of the child placement principle and give a bit of a test for how we're approaching policy development or program development, where that's come together well, that's where we're starting to see positive um, changes. But certainly um, one thing I think is, is a strength that's sort of rising to the top first in Queensland is where Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are participating in decisions about their children. So there was a little bit of a uh, about removing the recognised mm. entity from the legislation. The point was to make sure that no program, no um, initiative, whatever it wanted to be called, we wanted to make sure that never displaces the rights 
of children and families to participate in the decisions that impact their lives. So when we're seeing that happen through the rollout of Aboriginal family-led decision making in Queensland, we're seeing different outcomes um, for our kids. So under normal processes, we would see those expedited into the, into the system. Whereas we're seeing in a couple of regions in particular, uh, Brisbane and, and Sunshine Coast, we're seeing an, a, you know, a willingness to share power and decision making. We're seeing proper engagement of Aboriginal um, people and organisations, and it is absolutely turning around um, the you know, trajectory into the system. We're seeing a lot more kids stay at home with their families accessing the supports and services that they need. That's great. And I think some other jurisdictions, from my understanding, are doing similar things around um, family decision making and the seeing a similar difference. So I think that's a really important um, takeaway. Um, uh, Deirdre, I'm, I want to come back to you because one of the things you really passionately spoke about was the need to have good evidence-based uh, earlier intervention um, supports for families who are at risk of their children entering care. Um, but we're still in a very risk-averse era, our, our whole decision-making process is mandatory reporting, etc. Uh, are still forcing kind of kids into a system. I just wonder, in this era of kind of risk aversion, how do we un enable our system and our workforce to focus on family preservation and family strengths rather than risk and removal? What are some of the things you think we could do? Uh, the, I think... I think underlying all all behaviour is um, is about trust. It's about trust, and I think uh, as we know in this business, there's a lot of parallel processes that go on. If the government doesn't trust the department, doesn't trust the NGOs, doesn't trust <coughs> the, the communities, doesn't trust the families, doesn't trust children, um, we're all second guessing each other, and we're trying to overlay our own expertise over the top of each other and that's that's the road to hell because no one part of the system owns expertise, no one part of the system owns the monopoly on good practice or bad practice. Mm -hmm. You see good practice and bad practice in all parts of the system and so I, I my plea is really about anything that we can do that builds trust in each other in systems, in working with families, in trusting the, the expertise and the strength in communities. Like, that's really the road for hope. Mm -hmm. Not more mandatory reporting, mm -hmm. not more systems, not more toolkits. It has to be in the human endeavour with each other. Thank you. And now I'm channeling Ellen Fanning now because we've got a minute to go. You know, on the drum, they say, well, we've got 30 seconds. You've all got something to say. Can I just get a key takeaway from each of my panel members? What, what, what would you like to leave the audience with very briefly, starting with you, Claire? Um, I think to increase the level of permanency, we really need to improve reunification practice. That means we really need to work with parents. We really need to help them resolve the issues that are going on in their family. Um, and I think we still see too much processing of parents, too many, um, you know, barriers to leap, rather than actually working alongside and walking alongside parents. I think we also need to increase the quality of out-of-home care for children who will stay a long time in out-of-home care. We need to listen to children more and actually take on board the things they're saying about their care experience. Thank you so much, Claire. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, what's absolutely important is to try and make the first decision the best decision in terms of uh, placement and I think that you can only make the best decision if you absolutely fully understand all five elements of the child placement principle and absolutely move from a state of passive regard of that principle to active efforts, to actively implement, implementing that and making sure that we're interrogating the decisions we make and how we make them against those, um, those five principles. Lovely, thank you. Um, and mine would be about um, being brave. Being brave to call it when it goes well, being brave to call it when it goes badly. Be brave when we have no evidence and we're trying thing, things out and inevitably things will go well and they'll go badly, but um, the only way is to keep iterating and to change. Fantastic. Thank you all. I, w I hope you could all join me in thanking the panel.